Hi everyone, uh, my name's Aaron Verma and today I'm going to talk about using focus groups. Um, just to give you a bit of background, I'm a second year PhD student. Um, I recently did some training for some students on using focus groups and they said they found this presentation quite helpful to give them a general introduction to it. So hopefully uh, this should give you a general idea of what focus groups are, why they're important, um, and how to use them really. Um, I've got some of my contact details here, so if you've got any further questions, please do get in touch with me. So in this presentation, which is going to be quite short, um, I'm going to talk about what focus groups are, um, why focus groups are useful. I'm going to talk then about planning a focus group, um, a little bit about participant selection for the focus groups, um, talk a little bit about collecting data, things to be mindful of, um, and also you know what what do you do once you have the data where does it, what can you do with it um so hopefully by the end of this presentation you should have a general grasp of how to conduct a focus group and what things to be thinking about if that's something you're wanting to do so what are focus groups um and this is the most simple definition i could find and just really clear so from Kitzinger, focus groups can be defined as a discussion that is focused on a particular subject or activity. And that's pretty much all it is, is a group of people talking about a specific subject or activity or a thing or something. Um, and it's, it's nothing more than that, really. Um, but the question is, why, why would you want to use focus groups? Why are they useful? And when I wrote this presentation, I wrote it for the students and I asked them to kind of reflect on why they, th on what reasons they thought focus groups would be good. Um, but obviously that's a bit difficult to do on a video. So in terms of why focus groups are useful, firstly, they don't just help us understand individuals' attitudes, feelings, beliefs, experiences. They help us understand people's, a group of feelings, beliefs, experiences and reactions. Um, and it's really interesting because one of the really unique things about focus group data is that it's very naturalistic. So once you kind of um, get past uh, the uncomfort and the awkwardness of starting a focus group, you really, really kind of capture people's interactions with each other, the way they talk to each other. And that's when you start getting really kind of genuine data. And it's really, really interesting then as a facilitator and also as a participant. One of the other key things, and you know, particularly if you're thinking from a funding perspective or from a time efficiency perspective, you do collect a lot more information in a shorter amount of time. And I'll explain that this is kind of a strength and a limitation in a moment. The other thing, which is one of my personal favorite reasons for using focus groups is it allows the participants to be in control. Um, and you, you're not so much an interviewer when you're part when you're in these focus groups as the researcher. You're more facilitator, you supervise these discussions. Just make sure they don't digress too much. Um, and, and just keeping them on track to make sure you're discussing that's the stuff that's relevant to your research. But with every method of data collection, there's always limitations. So as I said before, okay, it's great that we can, can collect a lot of information in a short amount of time. But sometimes we don't have, we're not able to collect the depth of information that we need. Um, and this is particularly noticeable because sometimes the interactions within the groups can be lost. And when you're in an interview with someone that's one-on-one, -on -one, you're much more kind of focused on that individual and what they're saying. When you're in a group, sometimes those interactions can be a bit more blurred, a bit more difficult to pull out as well. And one of the issues around that is that there's a lot of less control for the interviewer. Um, a facilitator, with, when you're in an interview one-on-one, -on -one, um, the interviewer has much more control of where the interaction goes, um, and it's easier to manage in that sense. When you're in a focus group, people interact and they take their own course and it's difficult to know when to, to step in and bring it back again. And that's a skill, so it takes time and it can be quite daunting when it's your first um, focus group session that you've ever run. 
but it does come with practice. Um, one of the other things that I think uh, as researchers you need to think about from an ethical point of view is that some focus group discussions can refer to very sensitive topics and some participants may not feel comfortable sharing those their, or their, those experiences or their experiences even in those groups. So you have to make sure that you're kind of really gaining informed consent from participants to make sure they're happy about that. One of the other things which I personally find is that focus groups can be really difficult to organise. Um, and the, the way to tackle this is to have a really clear recruitment strategy and really clear procedures for data collection when it comes to writing your ethics applications or even just in your reports for methods of data collection. I find personally that emailing individuals and arranging a time to be the most effective way of getting people to turn up to focus groups. However, that does cause some difficulties because obviously everyone works on different schedules. Alternatively, you can have kind of drop-in sessions at certain times and advertise them freely. Um, and again, sometimes you can be waiting around for quite a long time for participants to come, but it can be somewhat effective to a certain degree. It's just making sure people know that your study is out there. So those are the kind of limitations that kind of that you might want to be aware of, particularly if you're writing reports. And particularly from an academic research perspective, um, it gives you something to be more critical uh, when it comes to writing up. So in terms of planning a focus group, um, even before you start doing a focus group, what you need to think about are the research questions or research question. This is probably the most important part um, that you you need to have pinned down before you go into a, you know before you start planning your focus group data collection. Without the research question, you don't have an idea of what you're looking for, and if you don't have that general direction, you, you then need to rethink theory, you know theoretically what what you what do you want to explore. So that's really really important. Once you've established the research question, you want to start thinking about how many focus groups you want to run and how many participants you want per group. Now, I would recommend that you don't have any more than eight people per focus group. Um, this is because I think eight is probably the most manageable number for one individual facilitator. Any more than that, it becomes very difficult to ensure that everyone has an equal say. Um, and also from a transcription point of view, you may find it really challenging to transcribe more than eight people, particularly as when you're in a group discussion, there are things like overlaps uh, and interruptions, which can which can be quite difficult to listen out for. In terms of length of focus groups, I would recommend, in order to have a successful focus group, you're looking at at least one to one and a half hours. Um, this gives you enough time to really kind of break the ice with the with the participants and also gives you enough time to establish and get some good detailed data. And lastly, that you want to be mindful of where you're conducting the focus group. I would recommend again that when if you're conducting a focus group, you do it in a private quiet room so that if you're recording either with an audio or video recording, that it can be very clear. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing it in a public setting, so avoid cafes or um, environments where there's likely to be noisy distractions um, for two reasons. Firstly, from a participant ethical point of view, um, because they, if they are sharing information, that's personal to them. And secondly, from a transcription point of view, you don't want too many disruptions for when you come to write up or if you're outsourcing for the transcriber to have lots of blanks in the transcript. So once you've kind of planned uh, how you're going to conduct the focus group or how you're going to approach the focus groups and what you're going to do with them, you want to start thinking about the participants. Now, without the participants, you don't have any data. So this is obviously a very critical um, decision to make. So based on your research questions, you want to decide what participants are most relevant to helping you answer your research questions. So 
for example, the example I've put down on this slide here, which you can see is a bit small, but hopefully you can see it anyway. So if you're doing a focus group about the experience of pregnancy in women, you would want your participants to either be women that are or have been pregnant. You wouldn't want men to be a part of this focus group because essentially they won't have the experience of being pregnant or will have had the experience of being pregnant in most cases anyway. So you want to be you want to ensure that your participants are relevant to you addressing your research questions or aim. Um, and you need to make sure that you're justifying this. You know, ask yourself, be critical when you're doing this. Why am I choosing these participants? Why this sample? What are, you know, what makes these people special in comparison to the general population? The other thing you want to think about in participants um, is you want to have a maximum variation across your sample. So that basically means you want um, lots of individuals that come from various different social backgrounds or social groups. And just that, that gives you kind of a bit more of a diverse sample range and it adds rigour to your, to your data collection and procedures for data collection. So once establishing who the participants are and how you know who they're going to be, obviously you'll start thinking about recruiting them. And with your research team, you can decide which are the best ways for you to do that, depending on, on what you're exploring. So in terms of actually collecting the data, when you're in the folk before you go into the focus group, you want to have a focus group schedule. Now, no interview or no focus group should be conducted without a schedule. Uh, for focus groups, I really recommend a semi-structured schedule. Um, this allows for flexibility for participants to interact with each other, and it also allows the facilitator some f flexibility to um, extend or broaden their questions if there's any uh, confusion with regards to that. So I recommend this semi-structured schedule, and that's a, this is a much more helpful tool than using a structured or non-structured interview schedule. I would recommend using open questioning, allowing for participants to keep their questioning very broad. Um, I would suggest that in, if you are to use closed questions, you use them at the beginning or the end of the focus group, just to clarify any points, eliciting a yes or no or maybe answer. Um, the next point is with regards to specific interview types. Um, so this is to do if you're working with a particular sort of particular theoretical framework. Um, for example, narrative framework may need may require you to collect data that involves people sharing specific experiences or stories um, from their experiences, basically. Or you might want to use a phenomenological style of interviewing, which focuses on the live the individual's lived experience of a certain phenomena or behaviour or thing, I guess. But that would be dependent, again, on your research questions and the theoretical approach within your data. If that's a bit unclear, then you can always tweet me. Um, you should be able to see my link up somewhere. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions about theory-driven data collection. One of the other things that I recommend in terms of data collection is some people use material as triggers. And this is really common in consumer research. Uh, where people will use, uh, have a product or something and get a group of people to discuss the product, strengths, limitations, etc. Um, although it's used in market research, you can also use it in um, academic research as well. Um, so that's not a problem. Again, just reverting back to your research questions, making sure those materials are relevant. Um, now, there are some people, there's some debate around whether to audio record or video record um, interviews, focus groups. Um, I audio record my focus groups. Um, you might want to video record your focus groups to have another layer of detail uh, when it comes to that. Um, again, just be very clear in your ethics and consent forms with that. Um, 
I don't necessarily think that either audio and video recording are better than one another. It depends on your research and how detailed and how thorough you want to be. Obviously, video recording, you get to see the participants in action, whereas with the audio recording, you just hear their talk in action. So that's completely up to you. Um, I don't necessarily think there's much of a... Um, I don't think there's... I think both are equally good methods of recording data. So up to now, I've given you kind of a general introduction of what focus groups are, things to be thinking about, um, and things to be mindful of when you are thinking about designing your own focus group study. But what I want to do is also tell you about the next step. So it's all great having this, you know, fab focus group data, but what do you do with it? What, you know, what's what, what's the next step, so to speak? So I'm not going to talk about actually analysing the data because that's um, just really irrelevant to what the scope of what I want to talk to you about. What I'm going to tell you is just some general tips of how to, you know, what to do with the data once you've got it. So you're, you've, you've collected so many focus group audio data and you have maybe hundreds of hours of audio recordings or video recordings, whatever. So what are you going to do with it? First step is to transcribe the data. Whatever analysis you're using, you need to have a verbatim transcript to work from. So I recommend either you, the research team, decide to transcribe it yourself, or you can outsource it to a transcription company or person to, to do it for you. Um, again, that can be dependent on your time and also your budget. So um, a lot of people say that transcribing the data sensitizes you to it. Um, yes, it does. You're more familiar with the data. Um, alternatively, if you do outsource it to someone else to transcribe, um, that's equally fine. You can still be sensitised to the data. It'll just be a little bit lagged behind. So once you transcribe the data, I really recommend that you read the transcripts or, and or listen to the audio again. You can do this with, on your own or just as a research team. But it just gives you an idea. You can start thinking about what's coming up, what, what's interesting to you. So when you're reading the transcript, there's two definite things that you want to be thinking about. The first is regarding step three, and that's thinking about what the participants are saying. So this is the content of participants, part, participants' language, talk, sorry. So, for example, if we go back to the example of women's experiences of pregnancy, specific things or contents that may come up are women's fears of labour, women's support from partners, etc. So those, those are kind of things that may come up as content themes or themes that revolve around what participants are saying. And the other thing to be thinking about as well, um, which needs, which should be asserted in, in, in particularly qualitative research, is how the participants are talking. So it's great that you've identified what participants are saying, but you also need to think about how participants are saying it. And this adds just a little bit of depth to your research and to your write-ups of your reports or academic reports. So things like humour, silences, interruptions um, can be really helpful uh, just to add another layer, another dimension to, towards your analysis. And those are the kind of four steps that should initially set you up to taking you to uh, conducting a, a further, more deep and thorough qualitative analysis of the focus group data. So all in all, we've talked a lot about well, I've talked to you, I guess. Um, I've talked to you about what focus groups are, why they're important, their limitations. We've then talked a little bit about uh, planning the focus group, collecting the data, uh, the participants, and also the next steps beyond what do you do with the data. So I've got this slide up just for some questions, really. So this is an opportunity for you to either tweet me or leave some comments below. Um, if you've got any questions about focus groups, then please uh, just leave a comment and I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. But for now, I will catch you all later. Thank you.